Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you all to uh, BioLegends workshop. Um, this work I will be presenting today was completed by myself, as well as our research associate on the strategic marketing team, Lisa Joe. Um, she has been outstanding on our team, pumps out tons of data. I can barely even keep up with her sometimes. Um, so the work that I'll be presenting today is titled um, Stimulation with a Super Agonistic Anti-CD28 Antibody Shows Treg Expansion and Provides an In Vitro Model for Immunotherapeutic Research. So to give you a general idea about what we'll be talking about today, I'll go through um, just some brief background. Um, our protocol utilizing BioLegends applications and reagents some characterization of the effector T-cell responses, some characterization of the regulatory T-cell responses, and finally our conclusions. So the cell therapy landscape contains various methodologies depending on the context of, di of disease statement uh, or disease state treatment. Uh, these can range from CAR-Ts to CAR-NKs or uh, regulatory T-cells, and there's plenty more out there that just keep coming up. Um, so in general, these cell therapies follow similar overall workflows in which cells are isolated from a patient. Um, they are then put through rounds of activation, expansion, cellular engineering, and so on. And then they may be um, reinfused back into the patient. Um, for the purpose of this talk, we're mainly going to be focusing on this activation and expansion range um, where a uh, deep characterization here is really um, absolutely critical to um, knowing exactly what these cells are before you're reinfusing re them back into patients um, so that you can prevent any uh, poor or unwanted outcomes. So just to make sure we're all on, all on the same page, primarily going to be talking about CD28 today. Um, as most of you probably know, uh, CD8 is a co-stimulatory receptor that's expressed on T cells. Um, it binds uh, CD80 and 86, and it amplifies activation and proliferation signals among, um, within T cells when they are presented with their cognate peptide and um, MHC ligand by an antigen presenting cell. Um, as you can see by the images here, um, CD28 also competes for CD8086 with CTLA4. Um, CTLA4 is a regulatory ligand that uh, um, possesses a higher affinity for the CD8086 ligands um, and can dampen down that activation um, once we get to um, an appropriate high state of activation. Uh, so there is a lot of interest in the field in manipulating CD28 signaling to control immune responses in various immunotherapies. So the interest in CD28 man manipulation was uh, very amplified when um, there was a discovery of super agonistic CD28 antibody clones. Um, they are able to possess um, this ability to activate T cells without an anti-CD3 um, antibody. Um, they do this because they um, have a binding site that is um, in a area differing from CD86 or CD80 and 86 um, binding sites and conventional anti-CD28 binding sites. Um, this allows these super agonists to um, bind in these uh, lateral binding motifs and form these linear complexes that are then going to increase the um, avidity of the interaction and potentiate activation and proliferation at a higher level than a conventional um, antibody can do on its own. Um, in 2006, uh, ooh, sorry about that. Uh, in 2006, um, there was a phase one study that was using a CD28 super agonistic antibody um, that resulted in uh, life-threatening cytokine release syndrome of all of the volunteers. Uh, since then, there's been a lot of work done to figure out exactly what went wrong. And what I found interesting from reading some of the papers about it is that um, it was primarily due to a high dose activation of CD4 effector memory T cells. Now, before the study, they did equate the doses that they used in the animal models to what should be used in the human models. Um, but however, they didn't take into, effect, into account that there is a lower abundance of CD4 effector memory T cells 
in these clean uh, rodent models. And also there's a lower CD28 expression of these effector memory T cells in macaques. Um, so as you can imagine, this is just causing a, a very heavily overactivation of these effector cells that are just driving cytokine release and that can lead to very poor outcomes for people. Um, so luckily it was caught very quickly, but um, this is why in these studies we need um, a very heavily, uh, a very heavy characterization of the responses before we ever even go into humans. Um, so since then, there has been a renewed interest in uh, CD28 super agonists, and a lot of this is in the autoimmune space. Um, and this is because uh, a lot of these um, in vitro studies and vivo studies in various um, animal models have shown that they are uh, Treg preferential. Um, so this is of great interest in the um, immunotherapeutic research in the immunotherapeutic field, whether that be um, vaccines or cell therapy. So at Biologen, we have developed a super agonistic CD28 clone. And um, today I'm going to show you some data looking through the deep characterization of that clone during um, activation using our applications and reagents. So our protocol involved taking PBMCs from blood with density gradient centrifugation like normal. Um, we then uh, did a mojo sort using our human CD3 T cell isolation kit, which is a untouched sort resulting in pure CD3 positive T cells. They are then put under a four day activation in four different conditions. So the groups here are going to be one group with just soluble anti CD28 using the CD28.2 clone. Uh, for the talk, I will Con, um, consider this to be the conventional clone. Another group was just our soluble anti-CD28 using our super agonist clone, which is the S20013B. Um, I will refer to this as the super agonistic alone group. Uh, another group we had was using plate-bound anti-CD3. Uh, this was the UCHT1 clone and the soluble um, anti-CD28 with the conventional clone. And lastly, our last group was using plate-bound anti-CD3 with the uh, soluble anti-CD28 of a super agonistic clone. All of these activations were done in IMDM using 5% cell vive T-cell chemically defined serum substitute. This chemically defined uh, serum substitute um, is known to contain only known chemically pure components and substances. So after the four-day activation, uh, the cells were analyzed for surface and intracellular phenotyping using our 27-color Treg panel. Um, this contains several of our uh, spark and fire dyes, as you can see. Um, we have some of our spark blues in here, our spark YG, our PE fire tandems, our Spark and IR, and then our APC fire tandems as well. Um, versions of this panel and other um, optimized multicolor panels will be available on our website in a very short time, hopefully in a couple months. That's being generous, <laughs> so hopefully in a month or so. Um, and I do want to point out that any uh, intracellular staining was performed with our true nuclear transcription factor buffer set. Uh, these cells, after their four-day activation, were also um, had their supernatants analyzed using our Legendplex platform. Uh, we used two of our predefined panels, being the Human Inflammation Panel 1 and the Human Immune Checkpoint Panel 1. Um, Legendplex is our uh, multiplex bead-based flow assay, uh, so you can measure up to 14 fa factors at a time and you only have to use about 25 microliters of your supernatant or serum or plasma in order to measure that. Um, so it's very sensitive. Um, I commonly get uh, values in the picograms per ml range. Um, so yeah. And then also for these four-day activated cells, we did um, a mojo sort um, dead uh, live cell enrichment. So we used our human dead cell removal kit and then we did SightSeq. So SightSeq is encompassing a combination of transcriptomics and proteomics, so looking at um, RNA and uh, cell surface proteins within a single cell. Um, at Biologen, 
The proteomics side of this is completed using our TotalSeq platform. So in this case, we used our TotalSeq A human universal cocktail. This is composed of 154 antibodies that are tagged with different uh, oligonucleotides. Uh, so that allows us to look at all these proteins on the surface of a cell um, and then read that data um, in later on after data analysis. And then we can go into MAS a little bit and I'll talk to you guys about MAS um, in a bit. So lastly, we also expanded these cultures in our recombinant IL-2 and passaged them every four or five days. Um, after, each after each passage, we uh, stained them with our 27 color T-Reg panel, or we analyzed their supernatants with Legendplex using these uh, same two panels as before, the human inflammation panel one and the human immune checkpoint panel one. So at a 10,000, at a 10,000 foot view, um, what do these cultures look like comparing across the groups? Excuse me. So at each of the time points we discussed in the protocol being days four, eight, and 13, uh, we took cell counts and looked at viability. Um, the viability across all of the groups was uh, pretty similar, all around 90%, so I'm not showing that data. But uh, the cell number data was very interesting. So um, you can see even by day eight, the super agonist alone group, which is here in the purple, um, is able to keep up pace with the anti-CD3 containing groups. And then by day 13, the super agonist alone group is already higher than the anti-CD3 plus the conventional clone group, which is our conventional method of activation. And of course, the group containing the super agonist with the anti-CD3 is showing the highest cell expansion here. Um, to give you a better understanding of what these cultures looked like, we did some bright field analysis. So we just looked at these under a microscope. And uh, as you can see, uh, this is at day 12, by the way. Um, so as you can see, the groups containing the super agonist are showing a higher cell number, and they're also showing a lot of cell clustering. Um, if you're a T cell person and have done a lot of activations, you know that this cell clustering is indicative of a really good, powerful activation that's occurring. We also just wanted to show what the supernatants are looking like. So these uh, cultures were passaged on day eight. So these are four day supernatants. Um, and as you can see in the anti-CD3 plus super agonist group, we're seeing uh, yellow exhausted media. Um, the next close would be the uh, super agonist here, which is a more like an orangish. And then the conventional methods with uh, the conventional clones are more red and pink. So they're less exhausted after those four days. It is important to note that there's no observable, observable CD28 staining in these uh, super agonist groups. Um, we just did an experiment a few days ago and have some preliminary data that may suggest that um, the super agonist antibody is hanging on for much longer than the conventional clone. Um, if you would like to see that data, I should have it in a few weeks. And if you will be at FOSIS in June, you're more than welcome to come talk to me. I should be presenting on it at that time. So looking at percent CD4s and percent CD8s, we have CD4s on the left here and CD8s on the right. You can see by day eight and 13, we're having a high expansion of CD4s among the super agonist alone group. And we're having a pretty drastic decrease in CD8s over time. Uh, so we're at about 10% CD8s by day eight. And I think it was around like 4% CD8s by day 13, which if you have done a lot of T cell cultures, you may know that CD8s can rapidly take over your culture sometimes. Um, so moving on from there, I'm mainly gonna focus here on the CD4 effector pro-inflammatory response. Um, again, this is a huge, huge panels, 27 colors for flow and 154 markers for total seek. So there's a ton of data there. So I'm only gonna show you a snippet of it. Uh, if you have any interest in anything else, feel free to talk to me after at the booth or we can um, email exchange back and forth, but I have so much data. So if anyone is interested, please let me know. <laughs> um, so moving forward, I'm just gonna give you a um, general brief overview of some of the standard markers. So overall, um, the flow data and the total seek data are very similar. Obviously, total seek has a lot more markers in there, so you have a lot more data there. But the ones that are similar, we're seeing very similar trends. So um, 
one of the main ones that I want to point out is that there is a polarization towards um, a CD45 RA negative memory CD4 T cell phenotype. And this is in the groups that are containing the super agonist or the, um, and or the anti-CD3. There is also an upregulation of activation markers among the effector T cells within those same groups. Some of these markers include PD-1, CD-27, FOXP3, CD-40 ligand, TIGIT, and then of course there's Gitter, CD-39, and many others that I'm not showing here. This is all of the flow data. Um, so you can see that the super agonistic groups and the conventional method, which is the anti-CD3 with the conventional clone, are all showing increased um, levels of a lot of these markers compared to the CD28.2 alone. Um, I also think it's pretty interesting how some of these markers, um, the super agonist alone is outpacing the conventional method. Um, in some others, it's uh, slightly lower, um, but I think that's pretty interesting. So moving forward, uh, this data is going to be coming from our multi-omics analysis software. So I will call that MAS for the duration of this talk. It is one of our analysis platforms for TotalSeq. It allows you to do flow-like gating on your TotalSeq data, um, which is coming from flow. It's super beneficial. Um, it's a little overwhelming because you have 154 markers, but we have some uh, helping um, tools within that platform that can help you figure out exactly what you're going to do uh, with that. So I would like to let you know that um, these, uh, all this data was gated on effector CD4s, and then I exported the effector CD4 specific data and then went into um, doing differential expression analysis and then built the heat map. Uh, so with, within the differential expression analysis, the CD28.2 alone group was normalized to zero. And then if something is showing up in blue, that's indicating a decreased expression of that marker compared to CD28.2 alone. If it is um, red in color, that is, increasing, that is showing an increase in the expression of that marker compared to CD28.2 alone. So just going through a couple of these markers, we're not gonna go through all of them, um, but with, if we look at CD45RA, and again, we're looking at ADTs here. So this is no RNA data, this is strictly uh, surface protein. So looking at CD45RA, we can see with uh, these three groups containing super agonist and anti-CD3s, uh, they are all showing a decrease in CD45RA expression, indicating a shift towards our uh, memory phenotype. We can also look at uh, CD99 here, which typically decreases with activation-induced cell death and increases with IL-2 signaling. So we're seeing a decrease in the anti-CD3 groups and a slight increase with the uh, super agonist alone. We can look at CD162, 52, 47, and 275, which is ICOS ligand. And all of these markers, I want you to keep them in mind for later because uh, we have some data that's uh, correlating back to this. Um, but all of these markers are decreased by pro-inflammatory cytokine signaling, such as TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and IL-1-beta. Um, here, it's interesting because we're seeing diverging patterns with the uh, uh, anti-CD3 containing groups compared to the super agonist um, alone. So the super agonist alone is having a lot less of that pro-inflammatory cytokine signaling that's driving uh, decreases in these markers. We also have CD54, which is increased with pro-inflammatory cytokine signaling. Again, we're seeing a lot higher increases of this marker with the anti-CD3 activations compared to the super agonist alone. We have CD62L and CD73, which decrease with activation. And then of course we have a slew of activation markers, which um, are all increased with activation. Um, some of those being uh, CD7, CD82, CD54, CD278. So in looking through these markers, um, I noticed an upregulation of CD95 and CD71 here. And that got me thinking about um, TSCMs. So TSCMs are stem cell-like memory T cells. They are um, a stage after naive T cells that are actually um, stem cell-like and they're able to rapidly differentiate into various T cell lineages. 
So if we go into our MAS gating, so this is total seek data on our multi-omics analysis software program. And we can look at uh, CD45 RA here on the y-axis, which is the ADT, so cell surface protein. And we can look at CCR7, which in this case is RNA transcripts. And we can gate on this CD45 RA positive CCR7 positive population, which is indicative of a TSCM. And then we can look at CD95 expression because these TSCMs are triple positive for CD45 RA, CCR7, and CD95. And we can see an expansion of the TSCM population with um, anti-CD3 activations, but also um, some with the superagonist alone. So here we're looking at around 4% compared to 34, compared to 69, compared to 95. Um, just a little note on uh, CD95. So CD95 regulates the activation-induced cell death, and we can observe a very strong CD4 activation um, that's occurring here. So some of those cells may be being drawn um, into uh, activation-induced cell death with binding of CD95 ligand. We can take this another step, because if you get to this point and you're like, I don't know where to go from here, there's 151 other markers, so where do I go? If you click on one of the populations, so let's say we click on that CD45 RA positive, CCR7 positive population, we can get these live differential expression tables that are going to populate right next to your plot. And it'll tell you exactly um, what the differential expression between the gate that you chose compared to the, all the other cells that are not in that gate looks like. So here, if we look at some of these markers, we can say that the TSCMs are showing a higher expression of CD25, uh, CD, sorry, CD71, CD151, CD69, CD49D. We also have decreased expression of some of those markers we talked about before, CD52, CD62L, CD99. And just for fun, I'm a Treg person, so I always look at CD25 and FOXP3. So if you look here, we have CD25 on the y or on the x-axis, and that's ADT, so surface protein. And then we're looking at FOXP3 RNA here um, on the y-axis. And you can see there's a lot higher level of activation of these TS TSCMs um, in the anti-CD3 and super agonist containing groups. Um, and just so you know, these uh, percents are 14%, 73%. I believe this one was 85%. It got cut off here a little bit. And then 95%. Uh, so moving on to... The last bit of looking at our effector response, we looked at the uh, supernatants of the four-day activation and uh, looked at some of these pro-inflammatory markers that are in our human immune checkpoint panel and the human inflammation panel one. So here we have interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, this is soluble TIM3, and then IL-1 beta. Um, if you wanna compare that back to some of the ADT data we were looking at before, where we looked at CD162, CD52, CD47, and CD275 that are all decreased with pro-inflammatory cytokine signaling like that of interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, and IL-1-beta. So that correlates pretty well with um, some of the soluble cytokines we're seeing in these uh, cultures. Um, one thing I did want to point out is that with the super agonist alone, uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokine production is more similar to that of the CD28.2 group. So it's not, very, it's not a very high pro-inflammatory response. So to give you a little break for a second, we'll give you some conclusions so far. So we have the CD28 super agonist is selecting for CD4 T cells over time. And um, you can see a dwindling CD8 population in that culture as well. The anti-CD3 activations are promoting um, the most pronounced effector pro-inflammatory response, and we can observe that through the expression of markers like PD-1, CD40, ligand, um, OX40, TIGIT, FOXP3, and the list is very long because there's a lot of markers in these panels. Um, we also observed a shift from naive to the TSCMs during early activation stage. In addition, we also saw the decrease of the naive T-cell population with these groups. We also saw an increase in pro-inflammatory soluble factors, including interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, soluble TIM3, and IL-1-beta. 
The CD28 superagonist alone uh, exhibited an increase in the pro-inflammatory response compared to CD28.2 alone, but it was significantly less than those with anti-CD3. Excuse me. All right, so during um, the analysis of all this uh, data, we, um, we talked about at the very beginning how a lot of people are looking at superagonists to being Treg preferential. Um, so given the low pro-inflammatory response that we are observing uh, with the superagonist alone, it's only right to start looking at that regulatory response and see if there's something else happening there um, that's keeping that pro-inflammatory response down. So I'm a Treg person. I started looking at Tregs. Um, so here we're looking at CD25 on the x-axis and FOXP3 on the y-axis. This is the day four flow data from the Treg panel. So this is intranuclear FOXP3. Um, just want to make that distinction clear. And you might look at my gating and be like, this is real crazy. Um, but here is the, cell, the same gates on uh, CD8s. So on the left we have CD4s and on the right we have CD8s. Um, so part of the reason for this gating is that there is a FOXP3 induction that occurs on non-Treg uh, CD4 T cells. And based on that, um, al also with the clone that we used, it's uh, reasonable to put this gate on the FOXP3 high cells and consider those my Tregs. Um, anything that is going to be uh, FOXP3 low to mid, I'm going to consider that my conventional T cell subset. And um, I can also give you some proof to my thinking. Um, when you look at CD127 expression among these two populations, you can see the FOXP3 high uh, Tregs have very low CD127 expression. Um, if you were to look at the plots here, this is around where I would set my negative gate. Um, so I would consider these to be completely CD127 negative. And when you compare that to the FOXP3 low to mid conventional T cell subset, they are having a significantly higher expression of uh, CD127. And um, even if we throw that gate just on that mid population, we still see a uh, similar um, significance here. So um, if we look at the stats between these populations um, among the groups, we can see that there's an expansion of uh, Tregs among these three groups at day four. Um, we have the superagonist alone is uh, showing very similar activation of both Tregs and conventional T cells as the conventional method of activation, that being the anti-CD3 plus CD28.2 conventional clone. And then we have the highest um, expansion of uh, Tregs in conventional T cells with the activation including the superagonist and anti-CD3. If we jump to our SiteSeq data, I just wanna show you some comparison and how that data can look. So this gating was done in MAS. <clears throat> so we are looking at CD25 expression. This is again, protein ADT staining on the X-axis and then FOXP3 RNA transcript on the Y-axis. So we're looking at our CD25 positive uh, FOXP3 positive population here in the upper quadrant. Um, so if we click on that gate and then we start looking at the differential expression table for that data, we can see an upregulation of a lot of uh, activation markers. Um, and again, this list is 154 markers long. So you can scroll through that and find what markers you find interesting and then do some gating and analysis downstream of that. If we jump to day 13, um, we start seeing a retention of our uh, Treg population here with the superagonist alone. Uh, so you can see um, we're having a lot higher percentage here, especially even compared to the anti-CD3 plus uh, superagonist group. And when we look at the uh, ratio of Tregs to conventional T cells, uh, we see a lot higher um, Treg ratio uh, with the superagonist alone group. And just to give you an idea of what these cultures look like over time, we have uh, FOXP3 high Tregs on the left, and then these are the conventional T cells. So by day eight, we have almost we have almost a 40% expansion of Tregs, um, and then that's still hanging out around 25-ish percent by day 13. 
Um, so that's pretty good. There's some really like heavy regulatory control that's occurring in that um, in those activations that is being sustained over the course of uh, what, what would that be nine days after the activation. And then if we look at our conventional T cells, you can see the um, sorry, um, you can see the uh, super agonist plus the uh, anti CD3 group has the highest expansion of conventional cells for both days four and eight. And then they all kind of converge by day 14. Okay. So now we can look at a deeper uh, surface phenotyping of the Tregs using our uh, site seq data. Um, this is specifically total seq. We're looking at ADTs, so surface proteins. And again, uh, CD28 was normalized to CD28.2 was normalized to zero, and all the groups are compared to that. Um, same thing, blue is considering a decrease and red is considering an increase. Um, some of the markers that I want to point out are the CD45RO. So we're seeing an expansion of memory uh, Tregs um, only in that super agonist alone group. And we're actually seeing a decrease in the CD45RO positive Tregs in the anti-CD3 groups. We also see similar patterns with HLADR and TIGIT. So HLA-DR can uh, show a more suppressive Treg phenotype. Um, and TIGIT, for me, I didn't know about TIGIT positive Tregs, but uh, apparently PD-1 signaling can decrease TIGIT on Tregs, and um, CTLA-4 signaling can increase TIGIT on Tregs. Uh, furthermore, TIGIT and HLA-DR are both increased on Tregs with TGF-beta and IL-2 signaling. We also have a CD162, which is um, decreased on the anti-CD3 groups. CD162 recruits cells to sites of inflammation. So we're getting Treg recruitment with the uh, super agonist alone, but not with the anti-CD3 activations. We also have CD52, CD73, and CD275, which all decrease on Tregs with pro-inflammatory cytokine signaling. <coughs> Uh, CD275 also increases with uh, TGF beta signaling on Tregs as well as AMP. And of course, broadly, we have a um, wide range of upregulation of activation markers and other markers that are, uh, that are uh, essential to the suppressive function of regulatory T cells, some of those being CD25, CD71, CD43, and so on. So then we can move on to the supernatants. So I'm not showing the uh, surface CD25 staining here, but I do have that data. If you would like to see it upon request, I can show you that. I can tell you for brevity's sake, it shows a very similar pattern as these plots. So we're looking at soluble CD25 here, and it was measured with the Legendplex immune checkpoint panel and the inflammation panel one. Um, I'm only showing data from one of those data sets, but I can tell you they look almost identical side by side. So at day four, we're seeing an initial um, high amount of shedding of soluble CD25 with the super agonist plus the anti-CD3 group. And then by day eight and 13, the super agonist alone is producing a lot higher amounts of uh, soluble CD25 than any of the other groups. And uh, to me, in my head, this really makes sense because soluble CD25 is driving a low zone IL-2 environment in there that's preventing your pro-inflammatory effector T cells from expanding, and it's targeting IL-2 to your CD25 high T regs, um, allowing them to, them to preferentially grow, overtake the cultures like we're seeing at day eight and day 13. Uh, kind of similar to the soluble CD25 story, but a little different. Uh, we see different staining patterns with CTLA-4 and soluble CTLA-4. Um, this, in part, can be due to the fact that CTLA-4 was uh, intracellular stain and CD25 was not. Um, but we see an expansion of CTLA-4 on the super agonist groups after four days of activation. And when we look at those supernatants, we saw, see the highest shedding of soluble CTLA-4 among the um, super agonist alone group. Just to give you a summary of some of the more, some more of the Legendplex data, here we're looking at days four, eight, and 13. Um, these are not heat maps. Uh, these are ordered based on which group is showing the highest um, concentrations of the, each of these one of, sorry, each of these factors in the supernatant. 
So the group with the highest expression of CD25, for example, on day four was that anti-CD3 plus, uh, plus super agonist. Um, and the lowest expression was that uh, CD28.2 conventional clone alone. So here we have uh, eight of the markers from the panels. We have a lot more markers in these panels, but for brevity's sake, we are just not showing them right now. Um, but we have soluble CD25, soluble CTLA-4, galactin-9, and IL-10, and then soluble TEM-3, TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, and IL-1-beta. In general, I want to show a general pattern with the super agonist alone is um, having the highest expression of these regulatory markers and the lowest expression of these pro-inflammatory markers. We're also seeing a very high expression of both regulatory and pro-inflammatory markers with um, the anti-CD3 plus super agonist cultures, um, especially at day four for these markers. And then of course, soluble uh, CD28.2 alone is giving us low expression of uh, both pro-inflammatory and regulatory, especially in the first four and eight days of culture. So with that, I am here at the end. So I just wanna give you guys some conclusions. Um, so we looked at the CD28 super agonist, which is clone S20013B, um, selecting for CD4 positive T cells over time and causing a dwindling CD8 positive T cell um, population. We also looked at um, anti-CD3 activations promoting the most pronounced effector and pro-inflammatory response. Um, we did that through looking at increases in surface marker expression of PD-1, CD-40 ligand, OX-40, TIGIT, CD-39, FOXP3, and others. We also saw a shift from naive to the TSCMs during the early activation stage. We saw an increase in pro-inflammatory soluble factors being interferon gamma, TNF-alpha, soluble TIM-3, and IL-1-beta. We observed that the super agonist alone exhibits increased pro-inflammatory response um, compared to the CD28.2 alone, but it is still significantly less than those containing anti-CD3. We saw the super agonist alone promotes expansion and retention of FOXP3 high Tregs by driving a regulatory environment that included um, a distinct RNA signature, which I have that data, but if you would like to see it, I can show you. I just didn't show it for time's sake. Um, and we also saw a unique, distinct uh, cell surface phenotype as well. Um, the soluble, uh, or sorry, the uh, super agonist activation drives an extracellular regulatory environment through the cleavage and secretion of factors such as soluble C CD25, soluble CTLA-4, galactin-9, and IL-10, among others. And just to give you guys a brief overview, while the single application studies are great and they can provide very uh, valuable information, if you compound these act applications, it really helps to fill in some gaps in your analyses and give you an overall picture of what's happening in uh, these cultures. And lastly, uh, the multi multimodal ca cellular characterization with BioLegends applications and reagents allows for an all-encompassing evaluation of your immunotherapeutic research. Lastly, I would like to give some thanks to some people that have been uh, very integral in helping to plan, execute, and, uh, and analyze this data. Um, Lisa uh, Joe, of course, who is our um, wonderful research associate on our marketing team. Uh, Eunice, who is our uh, flow core manager. And Miguel and Karsten, who are my bosses. They're wonderful. Um, they've been really helpful in planning these experiments and analyzing all the data. Um, Santosh, Frank, and Josh for all of their help analyzing the uh, SiteSeq data, which can be uh, pretty daunting when you're a flow person. <laughs> um, and then of course our marketing team and all of our um, uh, product managers that have been very helpful with all of their input. Um, Ornella and the Proteo Gen Genomics team that were very helpful in training me for TotalSeq and uh, helping me with all the experimental planning. And then of course our wonderful um, product development teams that develop all of our great products at BioLegend. Um, and of course, lastly, I have to thank our surf and CEO, Gene Lay. Um, he has created a great environment at BioLegend with great products, a great culture, and um, it's been a great time working for BioLegend. 
Um, with that, I would like to take any questions anyone has.